Good morning and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod, thrilled to be here with you this morning. So much on my mind, so much on my heart that I wanna talk with you guys this morning. But you know I like to give public service announcements and so the first one that I wanna to say to you, part of the reason why we couldn't be here live with Dr. Grant Pichet yesterday was because I had a doctor's appointment and the only time they could do the doctor's appointment was on a Tuesday morning. I begged, I pleaded, I was like, is there any, like that's sacred to me. Uh, I have something I do on Tuesday mornings that I really don't ever like to give up. And I'm sure they thought it was like going to a nail salon, but it was being with Dr. Grant Pichet and with all of you. And they were like, no, the doctor has no availability till November. Very special doctor that I, I got, I've been waiting forever to see, so fine. And um, so then yesterday morning, they called me right as I was leaving to go out the door to go to the appointment. They were like, oh, the doctor's had an emergency. We need to reschedule for you. And I was like, what? And they were like, oh no, it's just this afternoon, which I, I was like, oh, okay. So, you know, when I desperately needed it to be afternoon, it couldn't be, but now it can be, right? That, that happens. So I went to the appointment in the afternoon and in the process of doing that, um, an elevator attacked me. I, I've never seen anything like this. I went to get on the elevator and it closed on me and it kept coming and I, you know, put up my hand to like, like defend against the door and the gentleman that was also behind me who had said ladies first and let me step into the Cuisinart uh, he was like oh my gosh and my hand got hurt I had to have it x-rayed it was that kind of a day you know what I'm saying but in the process of talking about it with people I've heard three other people say that recently they've been attacked by an elevator door now I don't know what that is I don't know if it's a coincidence but I don't believe in coincidences and I don't know if that's elevators have changed or that we forgot how to ride elevators when we were in COVID, but I'm just public service announcement because I got attacked by an elevator yesterday is, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm one, it's not broken, thank you, but I'm, you know, it hurts like a, you know what. Um, but I am reminded that when we get on elevators, especially if you're getting on with children or people that are frail, because I think I'm a big woman, if that had hit a kid, ooh, or an elderly person, I don't count myself as elderly yet, don't tell anybody, but um, <laughs> you know what I mean? It could have done some, like, it would have broken bones. And um, so I'm just telling everybody uh, that, you know, when you get on an elevator, put your hand on the door to hold it back from, the sensor is supposed to sense that and not have it come. And if, when your hand is on the door, you feel it coming, Step out of its way, man, because don't be don't be run over uh, by a Kaiser Permanente elevator like I was yesterday. Uh, and just you you know, I, I had to move my mug to the other side because I can't lift it with this hand. My my hand can't do that enough. And I and more importantly, I didn't get to go do pottery last night. So because um, it just hurts. So be careful of elevators, because literally three other people said, no, I just had something similar happen to me. So that's not a coincidence. Be careful of elevators, y'all. Susie, good morning. Laurie, good morning to you too. So thrilled to have you here. I imagine there are others of you watching. Good morning. I am your crazy host for the day. <laughs> and Thrilled to be here with all of you. You have no idea how excited. I miss you when I'm not here for a day. I would have much rather have been here with you um, than there with the doctor or the elevator. But we're here again today, and that's a lovely thing. Don't forget that we're live right now on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter, and a dozen or so other sites. Traven, our fabulous Traven, is going to show you some of those. Um, and Rhea says, good morning, my son recently just started a new school and we're having some regressions. I am, uh, I am up, I broke my leg. I hope it wasn't an elevator. Uh, and so he's falling back in, into his old routine of making accidents in his room. Uh, okay, we've got you because you know what's funny is the other day we had guests who were lined up for today and that didn't work out for various and sundry reasons. Uh, but when we were doing the show on Monday, you guys said, hey, you know what we'd really like is a show about regression. And so Traven and I said, well, let's just give that to them. So we're going to talk about regression in all the forms today and about, you know, some of these things. But Rhea, I'm sending you a hug, first of all, because you're dealing with a broken leg. I can only imagine. I, I just have an injured hand. It's not even broken. And it upset my apple cart. And I just haven't been able to do. You take so many things for granted that you can just do and then something happens and you get even a small injury and it's a big deal. And breaking your leg is not a small injury. 
So, um, and the, you know, upsetting that apple cart can easily be something that causes a child to go into regression. We're going to talk about, you know, how regression happens and what happens to us as a result of regression and what we can do to mitigate it. Okay. So we, we happen to have you this morning, but again, you guys can be writing in just like these folks, uh, especially on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, I can see your comments in real time, which makes it super duper easy. Don't forget that we are available live right now. It's, uh, what is today? Today is Wednesday. Oh, it's the 21st of September. Uh, but we will podcast this show later on. All of our shows are available either on YouTube um, or you can get them as a podcast wherever you get your podcast. If you want to watch, though, watch on YouTube. All right. And please share. Please let other people know about us. That's the only way that we really get to other people is word of mouth. And if you find something that's useful to hear, will you please just, we're, we're not asking you to send in donations. People ask me all the time to ask you guys for, guys for donation. And we don't ask for that. I really am like, these people have other things that they need to spend their money on. But what I do ask you to do is to share it, subscribe, leave a comment, leave a review on iTunes. All of that helps us to get to more people, and that really is our mission. We're here to provide information, inspiration. I loved that this morning one of you wrote to me and sent the letter from the school that you got saying, you know, we are giving you a one-on-one aid after we went through all of that the last couple of weeks, and that just filled my heart. It was like cha-ching, fabulous, Um, another person who like took what we had to offer here and they ran with it. Boy, they did the work and and they got the one-on-one aid. That made me so happy. Parker likes the bobblehead. Yes, uh, it doesn't really look like me, but I enjoy it all the same. Uh, Did you watch the day, Parker, when the desk broke and the bobblehead went and she sheared off her little feet? But... Traven is so amazing. He's a whiz, and you'd never even know that her feet sheared off. Um, uh, Laurie says, impulse, love to update you on situation. Oh, yep, yep, yep. Please email me. Uh, So my email is Shannon, S-H-A-N-N-O-N, at autism. Everybody knows how to spell that, right? And then it's hyphen. It's that dash in the middle, and then live, L-I-V as in Victor E autism-live.com, Shannon at autism-live.com. Um, and, oh, Susie can't stay to watch the episode, but I'll watch on YouTube later. I'm very interested in this topic. My son has regressed, has lost most of his language. Susie, I, please um, watch later on, but when our kids start to lose language, that is not a wait. That is not a wait. That's an immediate Okay, and, and the first thing I'm going to tell you to do is to go to the pediatrician and make sure there's not a medical reason why. Okay, and that's not a wait. That's a, as soon as possible. Okay, and you may get no result from that, and they may go, we don't know what's going on. That's fine. A no to that is fabulous. Fabulous, we want to get that no, but we don't want to miss something super important. That's going to be in the presentation, but I want you to know that too. I do have to give the disclaimer at the top of this show and every show that we have lots of experts that we feature on the show, not the least of which is Dr. Doreen Grampiche, I believe the best expert in autism in the world, we, but we like to bring in experts so that you guys can ask questions and that you can potentially get answers. But I want you to know I'm not one of those experts, so why am I sitting here? I'm sitting here because um, I am I, a veteran and I'm not the most experienced veteran either but I care deeply that you guys get to answers. And I needed to find answers and I went and found answers for myself. And I now try to share the answers that I found, but that is not from an expert. This is why we call this parent to parent. I wanna make sure that you know, um, yes, Max, I see your email and I'll see if I, cause I can't take it down here, but maybe Traven can help me and take your email down. Um, But, I, my, my point is, I, I'm not an expert. I'm not giving you the expert advice on regression. You're going to have to seek out experts for that. But what I can give you expert advice about is what it's like for a parent for regression and what I discovered worked for us for regression and that part of it is looking at it from how we feel about it emotionally, to be honest. Because 
This is another one of those things where we need to kick it into action. When regression is happening, it means that we got to look at some things and we maybe have to change some things. It's a lot of times people will tell us, well, just wait and see. Just wait and see and maybe it'll straighten it out for itself. And that's not a good plan with regression. But I do want you to know that some of my advice is going to be go to experts. Yeah? But hopefully I'll give you some other things that will um, uh, help you. Uh, Rhea says, well, I have a big question. So recently we were in Idaho and the school actually was only giving her child one hour of special ed time and he was kicked out of school within two days of him starting school. Well, I have a bunch of questions, Rhea. First of all, are you planning on staying in Idaho? Is that what the, what the new thing is? Um, because depending on what, I, like, I don't know why they kicked him out of school. Um, but there's a whole thing about your child, if your child does something that is harmful to other people, for instance, as one of the examples, then your child can be removed for, from school. They cannot be removed from school for more than 10 days without having, um, what do they call it? It's like a manifest, um, it's not manifest destiny. There's a name for it and I can't think of it right now. If anybody knows what I'm talking about, uh, there is a hearing where they at the end or close to the end of the 10 days, they sit down and there's supposed to be a hearing. It's like an IEP on steroids because it determines what is the plan of action for moving ahead, where will the child be, yada, yada, yada. Um, and it's a very scary thing. It's not a kind of thing that I would say your first time out that you should do by yourself. I really want to uh, say take a friend or an advocate or somebody who knows and has been through it before. Manifest determination. Thank you, Parker. Uh, I knew somebody would know. Uh, manifest destiny, whole other thing, eighth grade social studies. Um, manifest determination hearing. And... Um, they can't keep your, school, your child out of school for more than 10 days, but part of the thing is at that manifest des, uh, determination hearing is that you need to establish if what happened was as a result of their disability. And I'm sorry to use that word because I know that's not the word that everybody uses, but that is how, what the school uses. And if your child, let's say that your child bit someone because of sensory issues and um, and then they got expelled because of it, and you can show clearly that it's because they're on the autism spectrum and they have sensory issues, then they cannot keep them out of school and they cannot change their placement. They can recommend a better placement, but it's, it's really, that's when it's time to either advocate up or lawyer up. And, and I can tell you clearly, Rhea, that they dealt with this wrong. They were giving him one hour of special ed time and then something happened, so it was wrong. Whatever they did was wrong. And it didn't, because I don't remember you ever talking about your child being expelled before, and, but maybe they were, I don't know, but it wasn't the right fit for that to have happened. That should never have happened. So you, you're going to have to get some help and support to go in really to present a front of expertise so that they don't um, discriminate against him. That is the phrase I want to use. It's called disability discrimination. Um, but I would, I would make sure you're documenting everything. And if you want to write me later, we can talk more about it and, and do, I got, I got to move the bobblehead to the side. She's busy bobbling. Um, but there's a lot going on there and you don't want to let this go. This is some serious business because if you, you know, if you don't represent at that manifest determination hearing, they're going to find a placement for him that, you know, if this is how they thought it was going to work, I would not trust what they, what they were going to do. It, not good. Not good. But so write to me, uh, Rhea, if you want to. Um, and Parker says you can call Bonnie Yates. Bonnie is kind of retired at the moment. I don't know how long that's going to last. Don't tell her I said that. But at the moment, she is having a great deal of fun of hiking and sitting under her grandbaby, and we love that for her. But Bonnie would tell you, Parker, you're right, to call uh, copaa.org. Um, don't call them. Go, right, go to that website. COPAA, which is the Council of Parent... Uh, advocates and attorneys. That's what it is. Copaa.org, and they will. There will be that the, you can put in your city, and it will give you choices. I do not know these people personally, but in general, their parents uh, and attorneys that became uh, they were their parents who became attorneys and advocates. 
So they've been through this and they understand the level of support you need. Uh, she says, I actually talked to the teachers and in Idaho and they told me the reason why they took him out of school was he was being violent with students and they were going to change him to a different school. Well, you know, um, our children, as far as the school is concerned, our children have a documented disability and that is why they have an IEP. And if the IEP isn't implemented or isn't in implemented correctly, there is the possibility for our kids to feel not heard, not understood, and for them to act out. And sometimes that takes the form of violence. And that is, you know, part, that is considered part of their disability. If it was raised, if the issue was because of their disability, they can't hold it against them even if they were violent. They have to come up with a plan. That's what behavior intervention plans are for, right? So, you know, that's why you might need some help. And Susie says Sarah Fairchild at Tolner is now her lawyer and she is awesome. So maybe in the place of Bonnie, you guys can still call Tolner Law Offices and, uh, and we hear from Susie. We've just gotten a really good rating on Sarah Fairchild there. But I don't think that they're licensed to practice in, in Idaho. So um, I don't think that Tolner is your law office for that. I think that they are California, maybe Arizona, maybe even Nevada, but I don't ever remember Idaho. Or as we call it, Idaho. In my family, I have lots of good friends in Idaho. All right, uh, but Rhea, I'm concerned, and write to me privately if you want. You know I'd be happy to take your email. And I try really hard to get back to you guys if you email me. I really, really do. If you're not hearing from me, there's a problem. Um, I try to be really good and relatively quick about that when I can. I do the best that I can. Okay, uh, also speaking of important things, I want to talk about something uh, that we've been talking about here really quickly. Yes, I'm going to talk about the acetaminophen thing again. I am, because it's important to me. And somebody wrote in yesterday on yesterday's show and, and said that they had some feelings about that and that they, they really feel very strongly that Tylenol has nothing to do with autism and that they feel that the study doesn't show that and that they feel that it's, they, they expressed some, um, uh, I wouldn't, I, fatutzed is a good word. They were fatutzed that they feel like lawyers have jumped all over this. Can I pause and be super real here for just a second and tell you that Shapiro Legal Firm did not reach out to me for this. I reached out to them. And that is the truth. Right here, 100% the truth. And I said to them, you know, it, I, you know, my audience are the parents and we need to hear more about this. And, and I vetted them myself. Um, for what they were doing. So, and that is why I'm reading this to you because I feel that this is really important. Everybody doesn't have to agree with me on this, but I think if you do a little bit of research on um, Tylenol and prevalence numbers, and you know, the first thing that ever caught my eye was that when you look at the rise of um, autism and when it's made jumps and try to correlate that with what else has gone on in the world and, and it seems like everybody around the world has had the prevalence of autism go up except for really interestingly not Cuba. Cuba has not had, they still have people with autism um, but it's interesting that they still have the same level that's much closer to what it was before 1984 and it's and and the way they present is much. You can talk to Dr. Grampiche about this, about that the way autism presents has changed exponentially over the last 30 years. And everybody scratches their head and says, "Why?" And everybody's looking for the correlation for why is that? Um, but one place that it has not changed as as much um, is Cuba, and Cuba is very interesting that acetaminophen is not an over-the-counter drug there. It is a prescription drug there. So you have to have a prescription in order to take it. It's a controlled substance there. I found that deeply interesting. And then, of course, the more you find out about um, the methylation cycle and what, how, the body, uh, how our body removes trash and how we um, let go of heavy metals and, and things of that nature, um, because our bodies have a system in which we let go of things that are not good for it right? Um, and the, our biggest organ that, that takes care of that is our skin. 
but there are other ways that we eliminate um, anything that is not good for the body, heavy metals, toxins, things of those nature. And that is part of our methylation cycle, how we, our body takes out the trash on a daily basis. And when you understand that Tylenol, it is now known, this, lots of research about this, well before this particular study that I'm going to talk about, um, Tylenol temporarily shuts down your methylation cycle and hinders it. That's part of what Tylenol does. That is a side effect of Tylenol. Please don't take my word for it. I am not an expert in this, but I have done some research and I've interviewed lots of experts. And, um, and here's the thing, like nobody wanted to talk about this for a really long time until this study. And now everybody wants to talk about it. And I'm thrilled that everybody wants to talk about it. So, uh, you know, if it seems like I'm a little bit on this bandwagon, don't be fooled. I'm very much on this bandwagon that more research needs to happen on this subject. And you and I both know that the research isn't going to happen unless people come forward. And that's what this is about. And the added benefit is that if you come forward and you're a part of this uh, if you become a part of this lawsuit and part of the ongoing studies that are done, there's a potential for financial compensation for you. For me, that's a win-win. And if this makes you uptight or makes you angry or, you know, I would ask you to think about why. Why? Because I'm always about getting answers. I don't know what the definitive answers are right now, except that I know that a study that was funded by the National Institute for Health that was done by Johns Hopkins Bluebird School of Public Health showed that if a pregnant woman took a, a drug that had acetaminophen in it, like Tylenol or Excedrin, that, or anything that contained acetaminophen, that they were significantly more likely to have a child who was later diagnosed with autism. It is not shocking to me that it found that because what we now know about the methylation cycle. Um, it just isn't shocking to me. I am glad they're doing more research and they are doing more research. But some, I'm, I'm, and I'm just gonna bring my cynicism to it that a lot of these companies don't tell us the things that we need to know or do what they're supposed to do or do the studies that they're supposed to do unless they feel it in their pocketbook. And if anybody deserves to get the benefit of them feeling it in their pocketbook, it's parents who really could use the help and support because their kids are now on the spectrum. So that's my soapbox about that. So I'm going to read this to you. If you or a loved one used Tylenol or other medica medications containing acetaminophen while pregnant and later gave birth to a child diagnosed with autism, you might be entitled to financial compensation. It's, you know, they're building this, they're doing more research, they're looking for people right now who want to be a part of this. If you think that this describes you, that you took Tylenol while pregnant and you now have a child and you may have more than one child who has autism, the law firm of Shapiro Legal Group is now evaluating potential legal claims by parents of autistic children. And I am personally urging you to call them. I know that when you go on your Facebook, if you're like me, it's filled with lots of, lots of people saying this, and you could call any of those numbers. And I, the only thing I'm saying to you is that I didn't personally vet them. I personally vetted Shapiro Legal Group. Um, you can call them. There's the number on the screen, 888-657-0455. 888-657-0455. There are timelines where they're seeing, are there enough people that were affected by this? Um, so that there is enough of a group of people that, you know, to, to do this class action lawsuit. Um, and so there is a timeline. Again, Shapiro Legal Group, 888-657-0455. You can also reach them by going to their website with shapirolegalgroup.com um, forward slash autism. They are going to ask you a bunch of questions, some of which are going to feel very personal because it's a legal matter. So I want to mentally prepare that, pre prepare you for that. Okay. Uh, I also have to tell you that Shapiro Legal Group PLL, because it's a law firm, you have to read these things, right? Shapiro Legal Group PLLC associates with attorneys throughout the country to help people nationwide. They are licensed in New York and Washington, D.C., and their principal office is at 60 East 42nd Street, New York, New York, and that this ad was read by a non-attorney spokesperson. That is me. But again, I reached out to them 
they did not reach out to me. Honest. Um, okay, so, oh, interesting. Rhea says if you had gestational diabetes, uh, you are disqualified. Um, and, you know, I think that that's an important thing. There are lots of ways that you can be disqualified, but I, it's very important, even if you think you might be disqualified, it's important to call anyway because um, they will keep that separate because this is only the first lawsuit. And if you know how this works with um, class action lawsuits, that there, there may be variations down the road. Um, but first they have to do a test case. And, um, and so they're building the strongest possible thing, which means that you eliminate any other potential thing that could have, could have contributed to it. So that doesn't surprise me that if you have gestational diabetes that you, um, you are disqualified for this study. But it also doesn't mean that you shouldn't call because um, you might, it might get to the point where that is also included, Rhea. So I'm glad you called. I, I appreciate the fact that you called. And I want to encourage everybody, if, you, if it's bringing up things for you and you don't want to participate in it, that is totally your choice. But it is a phone call, and um, I think it's worthwhile. OK, or I wouldn't be talking about it. Yeah. All right, we got to get to regression. So let's, let's bring this on and talk about what this is, because it's a real thing, and it's really important. Um, do I just, oh, there we go. OK. And I was going to put all cute dogs and things, but I decided that I wanted, you know, kind of rainbowy, peaceful feeling and beach for this morning. Hello, Liliana. So glad to have you from Riverside. Uh, I, we talked about so much. I'm, I've broken out into a sweat here. Um, okay. But, but again, I have to give the disclaimer that this is the parent-to-parent -parent talk about regression. And that I'm going to be talking about it as one parent talking to another parent. And... And I hope that you will remember that in all things. See, I even coordinated my shirt to go with the, the rainbow beach. Um, so, um, because this is not the expert discussion about regression. This is about what it's like for us. So let's take a look, because there's really two different categories for regression for me. And one of them is that your child is regressing into autism. This is like the beginning. And this is not everybody's story, by the way. There are some people who tell me, you know, because um, we always have our origin story. How, I always say to people, how did autism come to live at your house, right? And pe some people will tell me, you know, my child was born and we had a sense that something was different and we never met the milestones and they never babbled and they never talked and then they were this and so age and they were diagnosed with autism. That's a very real way to have autism happen. However, it's not the most common way that our that autism comes to live at our house for a like sometimes that's true of people who have preemies or that there's something else going on and and not always I shouldn't even put that out there but um, I will tell you that the most common way that autism comes into a family's life is that the child regresses into it that there is a certain amount of skill level and then and it may be that it's before they start talking, so we never get to talking. But there is a certain amount of skill level, and then, um, then there is a, a, a period of time where there is regression. Now, there are documented cases where kids regress all at once, like in the course of a 24-hour period. But it is far more common that kids regress over a period of months. And that is what my experience was with my son. That even though at birth, right at birth, there, was, there were some complications in terms of, um, I had a big baby and he was not nursing. And there was some concern about why was it, he was late to latch on. And, and there was, what we noticed was, because it, it became very important that he eat, because he wasn't. And um, so that was the big concern. But what I discovered early on was, you know, they tell you to make eye contact with your baby while they're nursing. And what I found is that when I made eye contact with my baby and he made beautiful eye contact, it just was that he couldn't do anything else. While he could not suckle 
while he was making eye contact. So, you know, I was advised and took some of that advice that maybe don't look at him while you need him to feed because again, on that, at that moment, it was like it became more important that he feed. And I wish that somebody had said, but don't, you know, don't stay there. And I didn't stay there entirely, but I discovered that he did better when we didn't make eye contact. Um, and I didn't ask too many questions about why. But then my child um, progressed and again made beautiful eye contact. He sang, he talked, he talked in full sentences. Um, and he was already starting to request uh, potty on his own. Uh, he was maybe, uh, he was already talking in full sentences and he wasn't even close to being two. And my, my mom came to visit and she bought a potty chair and he was already like going to it as, we weren't even trying. He was going to it on his own and taking his diaper off and sitting on it and starting to pee in it. Um, and we were like, look at this. We're not even gonna have to potty train this kid. He did it himself. And again, talking in full sentences. And then gradually, word by word, the words in the sentences started to go away. And it was so minute that I almost didn't see it. And, but then it was enough that I noticed it, but nobody else believed me, right? And my husband didn't see it and my friends didn't see it and whatever, because it's so insidiously, you know, minute how it happens until it adds up, until it added up to he wasn't responding to his name, right? Now, you might have had a, some difference with that, but we do see that kids lose skills and that typically it takes a long time to get help. And when I say a long time, I, for me, it took six months from when I can go back and actively look and go, no, I, I think the first moment that I was like, boy, why? He, he used to come into this room and he would say, mama, what doing? And then one day he came in and said, mama doing. And I remember thinking, where did the what go? And I remember taking him to the pediatrician and said, why, why does he not say what anymore? And she rolled her eyes at me and was like, oh, you late in life mothers go home. He's a boy. He's talking. Be happy. Right? Um, and that was bad. That's a misstep. And if I knew what I know now, I would have said, no, children don't lose skills. That's wrong. That's not a nothing. That's not in my head. And if I had to leave her office without getting some help and support, what I, what I could have done and what I wished I'd done and what I want, to, I want to encourage you to do is if you come up against a doctor like that, go to another doctor, get a second opinion because they're just wasting your time and they're not listening. It is never, I'm going to say this and I'm going to say it like 18 times, it is never appropriate for a child to lose skills. If they're losing skills, something is going on. Something is going on. Now, that something could be autism. It could be something else, but something is going on. And, and what I know now, and I know that Susie had to go, but um, when our child loses language, we need to go to the doctor and have them checked and make sure they're not having a stroke. And that is the very far out there possibility, but I know at least one person whose child had a stroke. And strokes are time sensitive, it's very rare, but you owe it to yourself and your gut and your child to honor this is happening and it's not supposed to. And anybody tells you that, oh, children gain skills and lose them, is not, they're part of the problem. They're not part of the solution. Kids are supposed to gain skills and just go along. It doesn't mean that they're perfect at it at some point, but if a child who is, oh, I hate the word typical, if a child is typically developing, um, then they are not going to lose skills. If they are able to talk, they should not then lose the ability to talk. That's something else going on. And whatever that something else is, it needs to be dealt with. And sometimes the quicker you deal with it, the better. Um, so that's why it's important for everybody to um, take the bull by the horns and, and go. Go to medical people 
and make sure you um, get information um, and until you feel like you got the right answer, okay? So, um, but it's a very common tale that our kids regress into autism. And I said, you know, I, it took me six months. I know people, it took six years. I actually know people that it took 16 years before somebody listened to them and said, oh, your child has a diagnosis of autism. I really would like to empower all of us to encircle those people and say, you are not crazy. If your child is losing skills, you're not crazy, go to a different doctor. And, and hopefully you all like give that message to the people in your life. Um, keep going to doctors until you get an answer. Kids don't lose skills unless something else is going on. Okay, but then, and that's traumatic. I always say that it's like, that's like a psychic wound that parents have. If your child was able to talk and now has lost the ability to talk, whoo, like the regrets and the recriminations of why didn't I go to the pediatrician and all that, none of which is useful. You didn't know what you know now. Um, don't blame yourself. This is not your fault. Hear me when I say that. This is not your fault. And your child is still amazing and it's going to be okay. But you know that old Maya Angelou thing about when we know better, we do better. So let's all know better. And let's spread the word to people who, how much would it have meant to us on that day if we knew then what we know now? So we spread that information, right? But then, but you carry it with you in your heart and in your soul and the fear is present, right? And you go through, you walk the gauntlet, you get the diagnosis, you do all those things and you start getting therapy and then your child will regress from time to time. If your child already has a diagnosis of autism, the, the potential for regression is always there. And it will weigh on you and it will mess with your mind and it will mess with your emotions and your time and your ability to focus and move forward. I, I, I'm gonna give you some tips and things and some things to talk about what we need to do in both of these cases. But I want you to know that it's the emotional part of both of these things is a part of your life now. And managing that, like the feeling of overwhelm that we were talking about Monday, is now a part of your everyday regimen. Let's just normalize it, let's call it what it is, and, and you, because you, don't, you cannot afford with regression to get stuck in the thing where you're like, oh no, what's happening, and catastrophizing it, and saying it's my fault, and what am I gonna do, and I don't know what to do, and being on that habit trail, because this is important and you need to take different kinds of action, okay? But don't, everybody take a breath because I'm gonna tell you some things that you can do. So let's talk about the regression into autism and the fact that it is totally, totally, totally a reality. And I've, I've talked to parents about this left, right, and center about the fear. And you know what people say fear is? Fear is false evidence appearing real. I don't know if that's always true. Um, because if you've had one kiddo regress into autism, you know, you go, well, is it really false? It's happened once. Is it going to happen again? Is it going to happen again with this child? And every time your child gains a skill, you're like, but what if it goes away, right? And then if you have subsequent children, you're fearful, but what if it goes away for them? I, I didn't have a second child, but every time a friend or a relative has a baby, I, you, from the time they turn one until they're three, I get a little tense and I'm watching silently. I'm watching and I'm hoping and I'm, you know, praying that they don't lose any skills. You know, it's a part of who I am, but you got to manage those fears, right? You have to bring caution to this that, and the caution is that sometimes it isn't autism. And the truth of the matter is, is that in this instance, you kind of hope it's autism. You hope it's not a stroke. You hope it's not some of the other things that it could be. Like on the list of when your child is losing skills, autism's the good one. Because um, autism is treatable and, and you're gonna have your child. You know what I mean? So um, we have to use caution with this and we have to make sure that we're going to medical professionals and demanding that they make sure that your child is okay and that there's no there's nothing blocking oxygen and blood to your child's brain you know 
Um, but uh, the important phrase that I use for myself that I want to give to you guys, if you've already had your child regress into autism and it's constantly coming up and the feelings bubble up and you're afraid, you know, you do all the things that we've talked about before, have somebody to talk to about it, write about it, you know, use whatever thing helps you, whether it's, you know, going for a long, long jog or a long bath or whatever, but I often say, just like with behavior, when, our, when we're doing a behavior intervention plan, we, we say, we identify what the behavior is and we have to come up with a replacement behavior, right? Because you can't just say, stop thinking about it. That doesn't work, right? So I gave myself a phrase that I could say to myself when the fear would come up, that he was gonna lose his skills again. And I would say the past doesn't equal the future. Past doesn't equal the future because it didn't naysay the past. I wasn't saying, oh, don't worry about that. That's so unlikely. Yeah, guess what? I won that lottery. When my son was diagnosed, it was one in 110 and I won that lottery. Don't talk to me about one in one. Then it was one in 88 and now it's one in what, 52? And, and if you're here, you probably won that lottery too. So telling me, oh, it's unlikely, that doesn't work for me. So I don't want to naysay that. So what I would say is the past doesn't equal the future. I know more than I knew before. And when we know more, we do more, right? And we do better. So I would remind myself, yep. The, and, and if he regresses, I'm going to know what to do. Part of what is what I'm going to tell you. So um, moving on here, let's go. So if you are someone and you see your child regressing right now and you're watching this show and you have not yet gotten a, a diagnosis for autism, first of all, good on you that you found us. Um, but I'm gonna tell you to run and take them um, to a doctor first and rule out any medical issues. And then I'm gonna tell you to get a diagnosis. Um, and while you're waiting for therapies to start, my next thing is to get that child as healthy as possible we do know um, that pesticides play a role. And I know I've seen some of the things that you guys have written in and everybody gets to have their feelings and whatever, but believe me, I've done the research on this and pesticides are not in, in their food are not helping any of our kids, whether they're diagnosed or not. Um, it, it is, you know, we're, we're at the point where I can say, I don't know that I can say causation, but I maybe can say causation. I certainly can say correlation between ADH-like behaviors and lack of focus and the amount of pesticide in children's bodies. We're there, we're there on that. So to me, it's a no-brainer to like, you can't, I don't think anymore you can completely remove it, but you can greatly reduce it. Um, and, and that and other things to get them healthy. We've done lots of shows about that. You want, I have a typo there, how horrible. It's supposed to say create an educationally rich environment. And, and I think any time that you see a child losing a skill, we want to go back to look at their environment and say, how are we teaching? When are we teaching? Why are we teaching? And, and are we making it fun? And, and educationally, you think, you think of your house as a classroom and decorate your classroom and put stuff on the walls. Uh, whatever it is that you're teaching right now, put it on the walls decorate your house as if it were a classroom and to have things to point to and and to do you know they have interactive things now that kids can you know move the numbers around or move the letters around people used to do this on the refrigerators a lot of refrigerators don't allow you to put magnets on them anymore this is a great crying shame if you ask me but um, there are other things that you can do put it on kitchen cabinets uh, make Velcro things, make it an educationally enriched environment where, where the things that are popping out at them are things that are worthwhile for them. Don't make it something that's a sensory nightmare for them, right? Like um, if they, you know, let's, I, everybody is different sensorily, but if your kiddo is uh, like bright things are hard for them, then do it in muted shades. Do you know what I'm saying? But make it an educationally enriched environment. And you know, the truth is you can do this wherever you are, whatever you're doing, however you're doing it. That you can make standing in line at an ATM an educationally enriched environment. Um, because if you're, if you're clever and creative, right? Not everybody's clever and creative, but I, you know, I watch amazing teachers all the time and if they're standing in line at an ATM, 
they pull out bills and they go, what's the number on this bill? And they keep the child engaged, engaged. And it's harder with a child on the spectrum to keep them engaged, but it's easier to keep them engaged once you've gotten them engaged. And so I think everybody thinks, well, you know, I have to give them a certain amount of downtime. Sure. But even the downtime can be educationally enriched. Downtime can be, okay, we're going to go play in sand. And, and, and so you're in the sand and you're playing and you go, I've got a car. Here's my car and I'm going to make it crash into your car. Oh, no, what do we do? Right? And that's still an educationally enriched environment because I'm keeping the child engaged. And what I'm teaching in that moment is problem solving. Right? Instead of what isn't an educationally enriched environment is when we are on our phones. And it's hard because I know I want to be on my phone and I want to check out. I want to break, right? But this is why we put together teams for kids with autism. This is why we do that, to keep them engaged. So I say get help. You know, circle your wagons, get help, and tell people what's going on and see who in your family and friends can help you. And I think get good ABA because when you get good ABA, what you're getting is a team of people who know how to make an educationally rich environment for your child and keep them engaged and then go play with them and keep them engaged. That's what good ABA looks like. Somebody wrote to me and said, you know, we weren't getting good ABA and now we're getting ABA at school and I want to start ABA at home, but how do I make it so that it isn't all sitting at a table? And I just, I was like, I want to throw myself down a flight of stairs. Because good ABA is not your kid sitting at a table for an hour. Like, they might sit at the table for short breaks, but for, you know, short periods of time and do something. But then we take a break and we go do the marble run. That's good ABA. So if all your child is doing is sitting at a table and somebody's pointing to somebody, that is the crap ABA. Do you like how I don't mince words at a certain point? Um, but I love our friend Lisa Ackerman over at Taka says that when your child is diagnosed with autism, it is not game over, it's game on. And it does mean that you got to get your ducks in a row and it means that you got to ask for help and, and there's a whole bunch of work that's going to have to be done. But when I say to you, it's so much easier to do the work than to be trapped in the fear this is what I have found and many others have found. It's easier when you stand at the foot of a mountain and you look up at the top and you go, I'm never going to get to the top. That's right. You won't. If you start walking, and you know what happens when you walk up a mountain? You can't see the top anymore. It's got to be in your head that that's where I'm going. But you have to walk in a circle around the mountain and you don't feel like you're on a mountain. You're on a path. And the path is slightly tilted up, but you're on the path. That's what you got to do with autism. That's the way you got to go. Okay, I got to move on because we're running low of time. Okay, um, but then there's the whole other thing about once you start therapy, because then you think, okay, I'm finally here. It's all going to be okay. Um, but then your child will gain a skill, and then suddenly that skill either starts to erode or goes poof, and you go, oh no, it's happening again. And what, you know, this is it, it's not working anymore. And we're going to be right back where we were. And I thought I found my answer and, I, and you spin, right? So the first thing that you got to do is to face those emotions and, you know, again, write it down, do whatever you have to do to get it up and out. Find the safe person who that you can just say, I'm having that thing again. I would encourage you to not have, I love taking that to professionals because they're not going to go, you know, well, but oh, here's what's going on with me today, right? You need a receptacle into which you can shout and throw this stuff and say, it's now it, I've said it, and now I'm going to move that canister of poo away from me. Um, and if you're doing it with your friends, the, you know, the expectation is that they're, they're going to tell you their stuff and you might not be in the place to hear it. Um, you can share it with your significant other, but after a while, it's like, oh, it's just too much, right? I wouldn't suggest sharing it with the people that are on your team because they're dealing with your child. And, but you need a place to take that, which is, I, and I love this telehealth that they have now. You know, in a lot of places because of COVID are covering the co-payment for telehealth. Uh, it's an amazing thing. Uh, I encourage you to check that out. Even if you do it once a month for 15 minutes, and if you, if that is, if your insurance doesn't cover in a way and the copay is too much, write it out and say, I, you know, I am scared. 
Um, don't try to push it down because it doesn't go anywhere except on your tush, and nobody wants that, right? Uh, it literally will show up on your tush. <laughs> Bad that happen. Um, but let's not catastrophize. I'm so good at catastrophizing. And, and, and I, when I'm talking to an autism parent and, we, and, and they, they, you know, I always say, tell me the origin story, and I can hear, and we get on the treadmill, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. We all have those stories. And, but you, but you, you can't, that can't all equal now because you need to do something right now. And the first thing that you need to do is talk to your team. If you, if you've already started ABA therapy, if you listen to the other things on the last, then, then you have a team at this point. Now, if you're really not going to do ABA therapy, you still got to have a team. The team might be the teacher, the special education teacher, the speech person, the OT person, talk to whoever you have and say, I'm noticing regression, are you, blah, 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 blah. It's not uncommon for a child to lose a skill, and it's different than before, but if you see that like big skills are losing, they're losing, then it is time to go back to the doctor, yeah? Um, but, otherwise, but our kids will lose skills. Think about this for a second. Um, we had a payroll thing where um, one, every time we hired somebody, I had to fill out this form. Great. And they trained me how to fill out the form. Wonderful. We hired one person. I filled out the form. That person worked for two years. So for two years, I didn't fill out that form. And now suddenly it was time to bring somebody else in. And they're like, well, you know, you need to fill out that form. You've been trained in it. And I was like, I don't, I don't, I didn't do it enough to remember how to do it. I'm gonna need the training all over again. And HR was fatuts with me. They were like, we, we already gave you the training. Well, but I didn't do it enough for me to know how to do it. That the human brain, in order to learn, learn something, it needs a certain amount of repetition, a certain amount of opportunities to be able to do something and have it be our skill. And then, I don't know about the rest of you, but I didn't really drive much for two years. And then suddenly in February, when I started driving, I was like, whoo, my driving skills are not what I need to hone up a little bit on my driving skills. I am not used to driving, right? I can still drive, but I wasn't as good at it. I've gotten better. Don't be afraid. Um, but you know, it, certain skills, you need to practice them to stay at a certain level, right? And you need a certain amount of practice even to get there to begin with. So we're going to look at some of the different things um, that, that might be causing the aggression. But our first checklist, before we go off the deep end and go anywhere, these are the things that we got to like go, mm, okay, what's going on here? Is there anything that might be adding to this? Like, are they sleeping? Because our kids will regress if they are not getting sleep just like you and I will. It's not some mythical thing. Uh, we don't have to do an NIH study. If you don't get sleep, everybody will regress, right? And if we don't eat a certain amount of nutrients, same thing. But here's, and, and we gotta look at that with our kids, right? What is their diet like? Are they only eating crap? Are they eating enough? Are they eating too much? All of these things could contribute to them not doing their best at the things that they have been taught. But the, the third one on the list I really want to take a second and talk about, and that's trauma. That trauma is a really difficult thing sometimes to see and acknowledge because it's hard. We don't want to think that our kids are traumatized. But I, I want you to take yourself out of your child's life for a moment and go to your own life. And think about when you were a kid, is there, were you ever traumatized? And I want to say that if you weren't, I'm, I'm so happy and excited for you, but I think the vast majority of us have had some trauma and maybe tons of trauma that inform who we are today. But we have fears and concerns and phobias and things we like and things we don't like because of very real trauma happening in our lives. Um, and, I, and so I want you to think about it through that lens because you're relatively okay right now. You're upright and watching a program. You're relatively okay right now. You might be carrying a lot of stuff that you really could use some help with, but you're relatively okay. And it would be unlikely for your child to go all through childhood and not have some level of trauma because I'm talking about like 
you know, a clown pops up at them at school, things that you cannot control, right? Kids get, there. it's a very, I wish we could eliminate it. I wish, 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 and there's a bunch of things where I fight really hard to make sure that kids are not traumatized. But the fact remains that sometimes they are. And sometimes it could be that, you know, something's happening at school and it could be one kid who's picking on them. And I don't mean, I, I don't want to belittle that because it's important enough that we see regression when something's going on. It is a symptom and a sign that we need to go, okay, what's going on? So you got to be looking and asking questions and put on your detective hat and say to anybody who's been around them, have you noticed anything? And maybe the babysitter is going to come back and go, you know, we were watching this show and then all of a sudden this shark came on and he freaked out. And, you know, and now it's a big deal and you didn't even know about it, right? It's not a harm or a foul thing for like it's our, our blame that our child has experienced this. But if you don't know about it, then you can't help them walk out of the dark place that they're in. And so ask questions, note, like, is there any new thing that they're afraid of? Um, is there anybody that they're afraid of? Is there a place that they're afraid of? Is there something that they were doing before that they're like, I don't want to go there? Um, and, and try to get to the bottom of it. Um, because that often is tied to regression. Uh, all of these things are. Um, and I mentioned the other day, and I'm going to mention it again, um, and, and I brought it up with fig, uh, the paper, filling out the paper for HR. We talk about intensity with ABA, and it's really important. And people aren't talking about it besides myself and Dr. Grampuche, and it makes me itchy. Uh, it makes me other words, too, but I can't say those. Um, because the studies were very clear that said the effectiveness requires intensity. And yet ABA providers are not bringing that to parents' doors. They're saying, well, we're going to do 15 hours, well, we're going to do 20 hours. But for some kids, that's worse than doing nothing. I said it. I stand by it. For some kids, that's just an exercise in frustration. Because it's not enough. It's me with filling out the paper. If you only have me fill out the paper once every six months, I'm not going to learn how to do it. And what I'm going to say is you do it. You do it for me. I don't even want to learn how to do it because I'm not doing it enough. It just causes me frustration. And imagine if I'm a little kid and I don't understand what's happening and I'm, I don't have the words to tell you what's happening, how frustrating that is when you're not getting enough that you get to the place where there's a, a reward for you, where you go, oh, now I know how to do that. And, and, and please don't tell me that three-year-olds on the spectrum don't understand it. They do. They understand. They are their own little people. And even if they don't have the words to tell us what is happening in their world, they understand when they have a skill. They understand when they have autonomy. They understand when they have a little bit of control. Um, and if we don't give them enough intensity, we run the risk of them just constantly. It's so funny to me that people, it's, it's the self-advocates that, you know, say they really don't like ABA and, um, and especially this, the intensity and I, because it can be traumatic. And, and my supposition is if you don't do the intensity, it's traumatic. Um, and I stand by that and I could talk more about that, but make sure you're getting enough to where they get to the reward. Right, uh, but also medical issues. I've had that on before. And then lastly, if if we're starting to see aggression, you really do have to be a detective and say, okay, what has changed? Has something changed? Has their sleep cycle changed? It's all information. Don't judge it. It's all information. It could be that you know their favorite cousin moved away, and they're having grief. It's it's often interesting to me that I will talk to a parent. And they'll say, well, you know, he's regressing. And I'm like, well, what has changed? For the, for the mom who wrote in earlier and said, I'm seeing regression. And I, and I would have said to her, what has changed? Mom broke her leg. That's a huge change for a little customer. That mom, you know, I don't, I don't know if he was there when you broke your leg. I don't know if he saw an ambulance. I don't know if he doesn't understand the cast. But that's a big change that makes me feel unsafe. I'm an adult. And if somebody in my life 
broke their leg, it would make me feel unsafe. And we all, as human beings, when we feel unsafe, try to go back to the last moment where we felt safe. And for him, if, you know, going into the corner to take my poo in the corner is the last place I felt safe, then he is going to regress back to that. And if we know that, if we know that, okay, first of all, what has changed is that there was this event and mom broke her leg and it, there are some things that are hard now, then we would want to look at, you know, maybe creating, I, I know people are against social stories, I'm not, but creating a social story about and drawing it together with him and saying, you know, mom broke her leg, but, but like, does he know that this is impermanent? that you know maybe you have to put a calendar up on the wall that says it's this many days until mom gets her cast off and mom's leg will work again fine maybe he's afraid his leg is going to break do you know what i'm saying like we would want to deal with some of those emotions but then we would also want to go back to the last moment that we were effectively working on the potty training and that might have been two years ago um, but we go back to the last thing that was working and, and we try that. And if that doesn't work, work, we go to the thing before that and go back to a reward system for every time. Maybe you have to go back to the timer where you have to remind him, hey, it's potty time. The timer just went off. We need you to go to the potty and then reward him for that, right? And make it safe again for him. I, that, a lot of that is supposition. I don't know if that is for sure going on, but that seems like a big change to me. Um, and, and so I, I, would, I would feel him out. I don't know what his communication level is, but I would feel him out to see. But sometimes you can work it out in pictures and, and talk about, okay, so this is what it is, and this is going to be the picture of when mom gets her cast off on this date, and it's all going to be okay, and see what the reaction is. See if that makes, um, Taryn says, is 35 hours good for a three-year-old? Yes, if it's good ABA. If that three-year-old is having fun, if that three-year-old, if you are looking at their graphs and they're making progress, then 35 hours you are in the window of the biggest potential um, success that you can have. I think 35 hours, especially in today's um, realm of where there's a ginormous therapist uh, sh shortage, 35 hours is great. Do I want you to be at 40? Yes, because I'm greedy and I want that for you. Um, but 35 hours is not bad at all. It's a good place to be in. Uh, but make sure it's good and make sure that he's enjoying it and he's having lots of opportunity, you know, where he's learning, where it's fun, you know? Then it's the good ABA. Okay, so um, when your child in therapy learns a skill, um, there's, they, they set what they call a mastery criteria. So let's, let's take any lesson that they're teaching um, your child how to do. I'm gonna take it to something for us. Um, my example is using a key to unlock a door, right? Because this is something that all adults need to know how to do. And we have varying different degrees of being good at it. I am somebody who is not particularly good with keys and locks. It's just not something I'm great at, but I managed to do it good enough that I can get in and out of my house, in and out of my office, in and out of my car. Do you know what I mean? But if my job were to unlock keys, we'd probably have unlock locks. We would probably, I would get fired for being slow. Let's say that. I just am not fast. I'm not great with keys and I'm always confused about which way do you turn it. I don't know why. It's not my thing. But because I can do it often enough, um, like I have 100% of success now using keys. Almost, well, there's one block I can't manage to do that both my husband and my son can do. So let's say I have 90% uh, success with locks. Um, that, but I, my life, I can live my life with that. Uh, I'm pretty, pretty good with that. Right. So we would set the criteria for teaching me the locks and maybe we set it at 80%. And if I can do it 80% of the time, we say, you know, she's got that skill. What we might find is that, um, it's not good enough because if that one lock that I can't do is the one to my house, that would not be good. Right. So 
some things we set a criteria like safety. It has to be 100% because you can't be accurate with it 90% of the time. You could end up dead. So different things have a different criteria for mastery. But, but it would be easy to say that Shannon has to learn how to open keys with locks 80% of the time. And you might bring in five different keys and five different locks and we practice those and we work on those and, and we, you know, and then you bring in five more keys, five more locks and we do those. And usually mastery criteria says that you have to achieve it eight, maybe 80% of the time in two out of three uh, sessions with different people. So I, it couldn't just be that I could do it with Traven. I have to be able to do it with other people as well, because maybe Traven prompts me in a certain way and, you know. So this is usually what the mastery criteria says. And so your team will say to you, okay, so your child has mastered, in my case, is that they've mastered being able to do the locks. But then I don't have to do locks for a while, or suddenly I meet new locks and I can't do them. And the problem with a lot of not good ABA is they don't take a skill that's been mastered and put it into maintenance, which means that your child, let's say that your child has 20 different lessons that they're learning right now because they're a three-year-old with 35 hours. And they will do these different lessons with your child and they will work on them in different ways and they'll work on them in a structured setting, they'll work on them in life setting, whatever, until they can get them to meet that criteria of eight out of 10 trials across two days with two different people and then they go, okay, it's mastered, right? And then some ABA providers go, okay, so that goes in the mastery file on the computer. But it shouldn't, it should go in the maintenance, which means that now I don't run that lesson every day, I run it once a month. So that I give my child an opportunity to do it and we don't lose the skill. And what you see when they put things into maintenance is that you, you have less regression. And that if, if when they do it in a month and, it, and, it, and the skill appears to be lost, then it goes back into a heavier rotation and the skill is not lost, they just needed some practice and the skill is there so we don't get to heavy duty regression anymore. So the maintenance thing is a very big deal to me and it's one of the ways that you can tell a good ABA and, and you need to start having conversations with what are my child's lessons right now so that you can be doing those in the home, right? But also what has my child already mastered? What is in the maintenance arena for my child? Because it is ideal for you, you can maximize their therapy hours. A lot of parents say to me, I don't know what to do with my child. My child's getting ABA, but I don't know what to do. And it's ideal for parents to be running the things that are in maintenance. Let, let your team, if you have a good ABA team, let them run the things that are new that they're learning, but you run the maintenance things. So maybe they taught your child the colors red and blue last week, and now they've moved on to green and yellow. Fabulous. Let them work on green and yellow, but you get in the car on the way to go to take them to speech therapy, and you say, I spy with my little eye something that's blue. And, and your child is like, oh, and they're looking all over the place and they start listing all the things that are blue. Well, you're working on a bunch of different skills there, but you're also working on blue. Maybe your child isn't to the point where they can name all those different things, right? The thing that we always used to say as we were coming up uh, to a light, I would, I would say, what color is the light? What color is the traffic light? What color is it? And, and he would say, red. And I would say, okay, you tell me when it changes color and then it would change colors and I would say, what color is it? And eventually we learned green, right? There are, this is that educationally rich environment that I'm talking about, that you don't just let them tune out in the car and you tune out, right? It's exhausting, it's exhausting, but it's so fun when you see how much they learn, how much more they learn because you're working on the things in the maintenance folder. The other thing that you can do, uh, and I used to counsel parents with this all the time, and the parents that would get it, it would be like, whoa, the angels would sing, but other parents would be like, I don't get it. So let me see if I can explain it to you. You have your set schedule and your therapists come, and it's great, except then a therapist cancels. And it inevitably happens to everyone, it's not you. Um, parents always, hey Diggs, uh, parents always tell me, you know, it's me, they don't like me, da 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 no, it is the nature of the beast. A lot of the times these are young people 
and they have other things come up and they get flat tires and they have to take a class and da 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 da, da. They cancel. I don't like it. Um, but you will get cancellations. If you have a good ABA provider, they will offer you a fill-in. They will say, uh, Rebecca can't come, but James can come. And most parents say, why would I want James? James doesn't know my child. I don't want James to come here. I don't know James. My child doesn't know James. How good would that hour and a half, that two hours actually be? And I always say to them, missed opportunity. Missed opportunity. You should never allow a session to be canceled. If they offer you a fill-in, say yes, send James on over. And then when James gets there, what you say is, James, today, I only want you to run things on their maintenance list. And James says, okay, because what you're asking James to do is to go through all of the lessons of things that your child supposedly already knows. Now think about this for a second. The goal of ABA is to let your child have a set of skills so that they can do whatever they want in the world outside of therapy the big world, that big, 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 big place out there where people don't know ABA, right? And the thing that they always said to me is, we're not getting your child ready um, to work. Because when I would lose a therapist I love, I would say, no, don't let him go to Dubai. He's our favorite therapist. He's our autism whisperer. Don't let him go. And they said to me, we're not preparing your child to go through the world with Peter. We're preparing your child to go through the world. And what we really want him to be ready for is when he's in fifth grade and the science teacher calls in sick and they bring in a substitute who doesn't know about autism and who doesn't know about ABA. And we want him to be successful on that day. We want him to be able to make that day work without somebody knowing him completely. And the way we get there is we start with people who are trained. But if you have the opportunity for a fill-in, have them come and run the maintenance folder. Because it's somebody who, you're right, doesn't know your child, but these are things that your child already knows and that your child needs to go through every once in a while so we don't have what? Regression. It's a really useful way to use that time. And sometimes they see, oh, the child can't do it with somebody who doesn't know them, which means it wasn't mastered to begin with. That's not actual regression, but it does mean that that needs to go back into heavy rotation and that we need to mix it up a little bit and teach that lesson a little different. So when you see that and you go, oh, you never cancel another session again. Now, people used to say that I would say that because the ABA provider that we were working for taught me to say that and told me to say that. I'm not working for any ABA provider right now, and I'm telling you this is one of the secrets of our success. Don't cancel sessions. Use that time to do the maintenance folder. Always have that educationally enriched environment and, and put that maintenance folder into it. Make it fun. And remember the 11th commandment, thou shalt not bore. Don't bore your kids. Don't, don't do it. They don't want to be bored. Make it as fun as possible. If you're teaching numbers, I mean, like, find something that's fun. You know, you can teach numbers with grapes. You, can, you know what I mean? You can teach numbers with a magic act. You can teach uh, numbers doing puppets. You can teach, and you can make, you can draw puppets on your hand. I keep doing things that hurt my hand, you guys. I keep forgetting. And then I go, oh. Uh, but you can draw on your hand and make it a puppet and teach numbers. Like, let your inner child be with your child. And, and let it be a little crazy. Let it be a little bit off. You know one of the things that we did to teach my son to count one, two, three? He used to have this thing. I have a husband who's an actor who's brilliant. And my husband at one point thought he was too old to have a kid, and he ended up being the best. And he would sit on the floor with a newspaper, and, and they had this thing, because my son loved to crash into things, and he loved a big reaction. So um, my son would run and crash into him in the paper, and my husband would you know, fall over backward and go, oh, what happened? But there would be the big crash of the paper, and my son would just laugh, laugh. This is when he was very little. And he loved it more than anything else. It was his favorite game. He could play it for hours, right? But he wasn't learning anything from it. And so then they said, when you do that, why don't you teach him that he has to wait until you go one, two, three, and then he can go. You're teaching him waiting. You're teaching him one, two, three, and he learned those things like that. You can take anything and make it fun, right? Anything can be a lesson. Don't bore them. Um, is that the end? Um, I think it's 
really important that, um, that we talk about regression as a real thing and that we circumvent it. Um, it isn't a wait and see, it isn't a don't do anything. But if you have a good team, one of the things that I said was go and talk to your team, what they should be doing is adding in lessons to, to combat that regression. Um, but in the meantime, you can help and support that team by again, you taking on all the things that are in the maintenance folder until you don't have to. At a certain point, you get to the point where they have the skill and you go, I don't need to revisit that. And, and it's no longer in the maintenance folder. Now, occasionally there's regression and you got to put it back in. Um, that we see that with potty training a lot. That for, you know, we get to the point where the child has maintenance. Um, and so we take it and it gets, goes in the maintenance folder because it seems like it's maintaining itself. And then something happens and they lose the potty training. And the potty training is one of the biggest indicators that something has changed. And you really want to look at what that is. And all that list of things that I said, take a look at all of those things. We see that for, you know, it's interesting because I think for us, where it shows up is in our sleep. Um, that if you are having a rough week, it's like, if you're like most people, it's going to show up in your ability to go to sleep and your ability to stay asleep and your ability to wake up at a reasonable time, right? You can tell when things aren't well because you're having trouble sleeping and it becomes that cyclical thing where, well, so you, now you're going through your day and you're underslept, which means it's harder and now you have more anxiety, so it's harder to go to sleep again. So it's kind of like that. It's a good litmus test that things aren't where we need them to be, right? Um, and for kids, it can be the sleep too as, a, as an indicator, but the potty training, when our kids who we're, we're at mastery for potty training and regress with potty training. I, there, there's always a reason. There's always a reason. Um, so be looking, and I hear Dr. Grand Pichet, whenever somebody writes in about that, she's like, okay, what changed recently? And it's amazing to me because parents will go, nothing has changed. Well, you know, my father died and my nephew had to move into the back bed bedroom and he plays loud music until two in the morning. Well, that's a change. That's a big change. There's like 35 million things that change when all those things are on board, right? Um, and, and we don't like change. Do you like change? I don't like change. Um, and so our kids have a hard time adjusting. And again, they will revert back to the last place where it was safe. And, and I don't think it's a conscious thing, but I think we all do that. So in any case, um, don't allow yourself to be just in the fear with regression that it's going to, it feels like it's going to go back to that first time when you realized, oh no, my, my child has regressed and seriously lost skills. We're on the job now. We're not going to let that happen. And you have your team, hopefully, if not, get one. And, um, but be a part of that team. Know what's in the maintenance folder. That's an important thing to know. If you have to make a chart on your wall and, and you know, have those things there and go, okay, so at least once today, I'm going to go through the numbers one to 10. And at least once today, I'm going to go through what, you know, whatever those things are, um, make that commitment because that's how we, we stem the tide of regression. One of the ways. All right, we're out of time. Uh, hey, we're back tomorrow with Let's Talk Movies, and I'm so excited because Moira Giamatteo is going to be with me, and if you're a parent who needs to have your batteries recharged, let me just say that TACA, which is the Autism Community in Action, um, their website is tacanow.org. They're an amazing parent organization, and if you're interested in biomedical or you're, like if you want to know more about that methylation cycle that I talked about before, oh, you're going to want to talk to the TACA people. If you want to know more about how does ABA work and how does ABA work in conjunction with getting your child healthy and are there medications and supplements, oh, you're talking TACA. If you're like, well, I want to do the gluten-free diet, but I don't possibly see how I can afford it because um, it's super expensive, you're going to want to talk to the TACA people. They actually have mentors that they can assign to you when you become a TACA member for a very, I, I think it's like $27 a year to join. Don't quote me, but I think it's that. 
Anyway, um, they have a conference twice a year, and their fall conference is coming up. Now, obviously, the last two years, they only had them virtually, which was great. There's nothing wrong with that. Some of you, last year, we worked with Taka to get a bunch of scholarships, and a bunch of you went virtually and said it was life-changing, right? Um, and it's a pretty low cost to go to the conference to begin with. Um, but at this point, we're at late registration, and it's a little bit more. And some of you, I think, would say to me, honestly, Shannon, that's going to be a drain on my finances. Well, I'm going to tell you something. We have some more scholarships, for because you know who's in charge of the scholarships over there at Taka is our fabulous Moira, who does Let's Talk Movies with me. So uh, Lisa Ackerman, who's the head of Taka, and Moira put their heads together, and we have a set of scholarships that we're going to be talking about tomorrow that we're going to be giving away to people who want to physically attend and then another set of scholarships that we're going to give away to people who want to attend virtually because you're not going to be in southern california and you're like i can't i can't take three days away to go do that but i want um i want to be able to watch the recordings i want to be able to see and i think in both cases you get the recordings either way so we're going to give away the, the codes and the way to write in and all of that stuff tomorrow so that people can get those scholarships. And it's going to be on a first come, first serve basis. I can't, I can't do it any other way, right? So that'll be tomorrow. Plus, we're going to talk about movies. And I'm really going to talk about the Pinocchio thing because I think it's a big deal. Um, I, I loved it so much, you guys. But I want to talk about why and why I think it's important to the autism community, why I think it's a really important film for our community. So uh, I'm going to be talking about that tomorrow with Moira. Until then, please give your kiddos a hug from me uh, and one for you too, and avoid elevators and put your hand up so that they don't attack you. All right, much love. Bye-bye. Uh, If you found anything helpful in this video, please give us a like. In fact, make sure that you smash that subscribe button on YouTube and give us a like on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Instagram for important updates. And please download our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much. See you next time.